thanks everybody. We've had another wonderful day here uh, and everywhere around the globe. And let's start the lightning talks. Um, we are gonna start with Peter Holzer, who will tell us all about his first clone six site. Peter, take it away. You have five minutes and I will air horn. What is an air horn? Wait, just to, to know if it works. Okay, bye. <laughs> okay, it works. <laughs> Go. So hello everybody. Um, yeah, I wanted to share my experience uh, doing my first Plone 6 site um, with a bit of e-commerce and it was in April 2020. So a friend came up to me uh, and said he wanted to have a consumer shop for his uh, greeting cards and I thought uh, yeah all we have everything. Uh, Clone, we have a shop, we have a mosaic and collection filter, as you see later. And uh, just returned from uh, Dresden for, from the clone tagung, where we finalized our plan to how we would theme uh, Clone 6. And um, yeah, um, maybe I show you a little bit the screen on. Go on. Go on. Yeah, it's working for everybody. So this is the shop. Uh, the start page is basically a mosaic page. Uh, we have a slider. We have some kinds of content listings here. We have um, yeah, add to cart buttons and other stuff. Uh, we have a bookmarking. We built a bookmarking tool that saves your favorite. Um, uh, also, uh, Katya used it for uh, the backend part for a React project. Then um, we use the product shop, um, which has uh, ready-made content types in there. Um, the overview pages are also uh, mosaic pages uh, with collection filters. Then we have even more filters based on uh, the indexes or the products that we have here. Um, nice load more function. Also have a nice detail. The navigation is done with collections. These collections also are um, mosaic pages with collection filters that build up the structure. We have uh, related uh, items that we show. So what we do, we, do um, we created a new plan team on uh, Bootstrap 5. We updated all our shop stack, uh, including Yapoville, which is uh, used for the checkout forms. Um, I mentioned bookmarks. Um, we have the product shop, which is basically a, a use case product to show, uh, to have everything in place to start, start the shop. Uh, there's also a discount package, which allows you to add discounts on card, on items, on sections of your site for users or members of your site and so on. Um, how much more time do you have? One touch. Um, we also started to build some rest endpoints. I think it's for the order data that we have in there. Uh, lately, we added another payment uh, integration for Volley. Um, yeah, and I, I'm still surprised that not everyone knows about the shop, but uh, we are kind of bad in doing releases or we are good in playing the imposter story. Um, but we, We'll meet in next year in March or April around that time. And we'll be sprinting on commerce or on BDA plan shop. So if you're interested, have uh, opinions, feedback, or just wanna uh, 
work with us, uh, join us. And we will be finally, hopefully, doing a release. And it will be Plone 6 only then. Thank you, Peter. Um, that's such a shame I didn't get to use the air horn yet. Um, but we'll, I'm sure we will get to that uh, sooner or later. Oh, I should move back onto the bombing cross here because otherwise everything goes wrong. And next up, we have Michael McFadden, which is um, the thing that everybody has been waiting for, namely web developer confessions. The really embarrassing stuff that people voluntarily gave up on this anonymous, maybe not so anonymous because it was a Google form, but maybe anonymous web form. So, Michael, please take it away. Michael, you're muted. Yeah, now I'm not muted. Um, I have a confession to make. I can't find the mute button sometimes. Um, I, I made this presentation and I'm really proud of it. So I wanna share it with you. One person admitted to using Perl as their CGI, as their, as their gateway interface. Um, we don't know who owned those Perl scripts, whether it was Root or Apache or maybe him, himself, you know, just change mod 777 and you can get everything to work. Yeah. I did some research here and found out how you can implement Blink um, if you want to, because it's, it's bad that they took it away. These slides will be available after the presentation. Um, yeah. Sometimes um, we have to do this because um, we need to access people's accounts to fix their stuff, but we do take precautions. Um, it's important to put power into the hands of web editorial because we have lives, we have to do things too. We have, you know, sleep and video games and stuff. So it's good that other people can do work. Um, yeah, this slide kind of speaks for itself. There was a great talk about um, today about importing into Plum sites, and this was not covered. It's 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 a it's a way you can do imports. I don't know who this is. His name is Root. Um, this to me is not a problem. I, I included it because it was, it was there. Um, 
Um, hola. Um, sometimes um, we can't find what we need to edit. And You know, this is why we get paid good money to do our work. I don't like changing something and seeing it affect something else. I agree with this. True stories. At least they were true on a Google form. Oh, sorry. Um, downtime. Downtime is good. Yeah, custom folders are really, really nice ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, this is, yeah. But they, you can get the work done so quickly. Uh, this was a good tip. I didn't know this. And I'm going to use this. Yeah. We'll have to figure out the air horn, otherwise I'll just shout. Um, next up is Fulvio Casali, um, who will be talking about loan sponsorship. So if you need to atone for all the sins that were just shown in Michael's talk, this is an excellent way to sort of like relieve your conscience and pay all your sins away. The Catholics have done this for millennia. It's, it works guaranteed. So if you did any of those, we have the solution. Um, Fulvio, take it away. All right. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yep, yeah, you're good. All right, good. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Fulvio, and I am here to encourage everybody to uh, make rage donations. Um, and just just to clarify, what I'm talking about here is not the sponsor, the conference of sponsorships but the kind of sponsorships that you can make uh, on a regular basis. Because barter economies are nice, but in the real world, sometimes we also need hard cash. Um, in open source, contributions in labor of love are like gas in the tank, like everything you do, basically day in and day out, writing documentation, writing training, giving training, writing code, uh, helping out in teams and so on is a labor of love. And it's the gas that we need to get the car to move because without the gas, the car won't run. And thanks to you, we have a lot of gas. We've been running for 20 years and, and still have a long range in our tank. And if the tank's too small, we can get a bigger car, we can get a truck, we can get a, uh, an airplane and pollute the, 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 the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. Now, 
sorry, wrong thought. Um, but sooner or later, gas isn't enough. You also need an oil change, spare parts, insurance, registration fees, and so on, which require hard cash. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if you want to see how we spend the money in the Sloan Foundation, you can uh, you can see the annual financial report at the annual meeting this week. But in a nutshell, this is how it works. On the right, we have administrative costs. We have to pay for hosting, for uh, Google uh, Docs, our Google Workspace, for uh, um, mail gun, trademarks, sometimes we have to hire lawyers, we have to pay fees, membership, and also we sponsor other things like uh, other conferences, the Python Foundation and so on. But in return, we try to give you a nice car to travel in, like with uh, sprints and conferences and we pay a small stipend to release managers just to make um, our lives easier in filling the gas tank. Now, here's the question, and there's a, a poll in the Slido on the right, and I would really be interested in the answers. Do you support independent media? Do you pay a monthly subscription to your favorite artist or your favorite podcast? Uh, using platforms like Patreon, Substack, Medium, uh, YouTube, and so on. Please let me know. Maybe you just pay $1 a month, $5 a month, whatever it is. If not, ask your boss. They probably do. And here's another question. Have you watched or listened to the Plone Newsroom or the Plone Podcast. And I rest my case. And that's, that's all because I want to give you the satisfaction that comes from being a financial contributor. And we have people who do that already. That They are listed on this page. And those are individual sponsors. We also want to help companies to sponsor Plone um, as corporate sponsors or as university sponsors. There are different sponsors. Uh, there's a subset of sponsors, which is providers. So uh, not all sponsors are providers. There are some companies who uh, are not technology companies, like there is a cleaning uh, company that uh, just loves Plone and they use it for their website and so they want to help us and so they they keep giving us money and we we'll gladly accept it. Uh, but if you have, and as most of you do, um, if you work or run a company that provides Plone solutions or hosting or whatever, um, you can also be listed on the on Plone.org, which is kind of gives you a little SEO. All right, final thing: contact me. Don't don't contact Kim. I've been doing this for a year, uh, and uh, leave Kim alone. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Fulvio, for that inspiring talk. And yes, this would be a great time for you all to sponsor. Next up is Dylan Jay with his talk, How Drupal Won Down Under, um, which I think means the continent down under, given where the region where he's from. So take it away, Dylan. Uh, I cannot share screen while another participant is sharing. How do I share my screen? Fulvio, you'll need to stop Fulvio sharing, please. Fulvio stops sharing. That's definitely oversharing. Uh, stop sharing. 
Okay. Desktop two. Okay. Uh, Is that working? No? Not yet. No. Yes, you your five minutes are starting now. Okay, so um, I uh, really enjoyed um, Red Turtle's presentation the other day, and it was interesting seeing how many um, government websites are still getting done with Plone. Um, so this is a couple of stories from the governments that we work in, which is UK and Australia, and how other CMSs really won the day. Um, which I thought could be useful, um, particularly now we have a kind of opportunity with Plone 6, maybe to, um, to gain some ground back. Um, so New South Wales, uh, in, in Australia, there's a company called Previous Next who are a Drupal shop. They, they um, got the contract to build uh, the main portal for one of the states there um, in 2009. And I think this is the really clever thing that they did, which is they launched something called AGOV, which is a distribution of um, Drupal, um, specifically tailored for the Australian Gov. So there was a Drupal Gov, um, which was, you know, like a, a distribution and a community around government stuff for Drupal, but they specifically made one for Australia. I think it's somewhat similar to what happened with um, Brazil, but they open sourced it and they launched it with a big launch. Uh, party and everything and talked about how this was the Australian government CMS that's open um, and all their wording and stuff was was like that. Um, came with example content, it uh, particularly focused on Wicked compliance and having tools for allowing um, checking of Wicked um, accessibility, et cetera. Um, and that was in 2012. They also organized a Drupal Gov conference in Canberra, which was the, is the capital. Um, the previous next then launched, uh, obviously got the contract to launch the main portal for uh, the federal main central government. Um, then there was talk of the government proposing to standardize on Drupal as a technology. So their idea was that uh, we're not going to just go with one provider because it's open source we're going to have multiple providers but we're going to go on one technology because that's going to save us money uh 2015 they launched uh this gov cms so effectively they forked the um the distribution but along with this came uh, a hosting platform which was backed by acquia and built on their uh cloud factory system um, and in fact the whole most of this stuff here couldn't have been done without Acquia. Um, Acquia is, if you don't know, is Drupal's sort of big behemoth company that offers, and what they do, which I think is clever, is they offer support and backing for smaller companies. So you could go in and bid on bigger projects and say, well, we're supported by Acquia. And as someone told me was in, um, very early on when I started working with governments, you know, Become big organizations like to deal with other big organizations. They feel comfortable that way. Um, yep, so they have, you know, you can deploy um, the distribution yourself. They can host it yourself. Um, there's, there's multiple options there. Uh, so the second one I want to talk about is the UK, uh, which is what they did. So they originally had DirectGov, which is their, their government portal in 2011. They did this huge um, audit and worked out they spent a billion dollars on IT infrastructure. Um, so they kind of, not just websites, um, but IT across the um, billion pounds, sorry. They, what they did is they, they said, okay, we're gonna have one CMS and it's gonna be one website. So they actually, what they did is they took hundreds of government websites, all the content from those government websites and put them onto one purpose-built CMS, which was built in Ruby, I think. They built it themselves. Um, and so they don't have a template that they roll out again and again and again for different um, agencies. They have just one website uh, with all the content in. And the clever thing they did is they split out 
these services. So anything that's basically app related or form related or a bit more complicated needs data runs on its own servers separate from the main government website um, where you have a button that kind of clicks off. It still looks like it. It has a whole design guide to make it look exactly like like the thing, but it will run on different servers and so on, and can be written in anything. They don't they don't mandate what technology is written in. They just mandate what it looks like and its accessibility and so on. So there's a bunch of ideas for Plone. Maybe uh, um, this this idea of of making a distribution just for your particular government, I think, is a really good idea. It's too late. Weep, for weep, weep, okay. okay. Done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you could stop sharing, then we can get on with the next talk, which is going to be Johannes. Uh, no, sorry, that's the next one. It's going to be Mike first. Mike Der Stoppen with the current state of mockup. Take it away, Mike. Mike, are you there? We don't hear you. Yes. But we still don't hear you. We didn't hear you, Mike. Um, ooh, you should probably unmute yourself. It is difficult. Technology, I know, man and technology, never a good combination. Um, but there is a button down uh, at the lower left that says um, mute and unmute. And he's gone. Um, OK, so we will switch order then. Um, I don't know if, uh, oh, there he is. Maybe, uh, Eric, if you can let him in. We'll give it one more try before we move on to the next contestant. This is almost like Squid Game. Um, we have remote buzzing equipment in place. Mike, uh, try again and unmute no. yourself. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't working, it wasn't working. You can hear me now? Yes. Okay, I will just go ahead because there's a lag. Yeah. yeah you should close Loud Swarm so that, because we're hearing it a little yeah. bit in your background. Okay, um, I just want to give the current state of the ES6 development, um, which was going on the, yeah, over the last year and, and a, a bit more. The first thing is uh, the pattern slip, um, which is partly used in Plone. Uh, the migration there was finished a while ago, um, mostly by uh, Johannes Röger. Um, we also replaced some of the mockup patterns uh, with uh, alternatives from pattern slip because they are better maintained and uh, do a better job uh, in some cases. Mockup itself, which is heavily used in Plone, uh, most of the patterns are already uh, finished. Um, we have just a few patterns left uh, where, where it needs a bit of work. Um, Plone Classic UI front end works basically. The only issues uh, which are left are in, uh, in some control panels. Uh, we will continue on the weekend. Uh, on the sprints and uh, also uh, 
yeah, in the coming weeks. Uh, this is a short overview. Uh, so most of the blue uh, check marks are uh, at least functioning. Some need a bit more tests. Um, but we have a couple of patterns where we need uh, to work on. It could be also that one or two patterns are removed completely because they're not directly used in clone and that's uh, um, then not our business. Um, yeah, things will get easier. So we will have no more require.js yelling at you. Um, Add-ons can provide uh, require and ship any JavaScript module they need. Um, clone will uh, only load uh, everything once, uh, thanks to Webpack Module uh, Federation. Uh, Hannes will uh, give a bit more detail uh, in the lightning talk after that. And also uh, I can recommend his, his talk uh, about the tip tap. Uh, he also gave some insights there. The timeline, um, yeah, we have a bit of work uh, still to do, uh, but uh, we try to uh, finish this up uh, this year so that we can uh, merge uh, yeah, soon uh, the ES6 branch into the master. You can give it a try. Uh, you can just uh, try out the build.core core dev, um, just uh, use the plip file you see there. And uh, there's also some documentation, just ping us in Discord. Uh, we, we hang around there regularly. Yeah, it would be nice to have some people also joining us. Uh, testing is really appreciated um, as early as possible. And also, yeah, some hands-on deck would be nice. It's just a few people who spend a lot of uh, time, but and recently we got a bit more help, but it's never too much. So that's it from my side. Uh, yeah, I give the mic to Hannes then. Woo! Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And to continue on this topic, we are switching right over to his partner in crime, um, which is Johannes Ragam, who will tell what sounds like the next science fiction series, but actually is something completely else. He will talk, uh, he will tell us all about Webpack Module Federation. Take it away, Johannes. Muted, muted, unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, same problem. Do you, can, can you hear me? It works. Good, good. So uh, screen sharing is hopefully also visible. Uh, I'll show you something about this Webpack Module Federation and how we want to integrate JavaScript bundles in Clone in the future. So uh, the goal of including JavaScript um, is that we want to have add-ons uh, for clone without the need of recompiling them, the JavaScript stack there. Um, also, we don't want to have code duplication, or if we have one, then it should be just, uh, just a ve very little. Then the bundle size should be small, and we should want to have a good performance, of course. This was hard to achieve with Clone 5 and Require.js. There were some options with this stub modules option in the bundle configuration, and um, but still it was not very flexible. And there is a new concept, Webpack Module Federation, or Module Federation, because it's actually not bound to Webpack itself, but we are now using Webpack in in mockup and bed and sleep that uh, allows us to have separate bundles where which can have dependencies between each other and we can for example define shared libraries like jquery should be just used one instance by all of the dependent all of the bundles which depend on jquery and not every not every bundle uh, loading its own jQuery. And um, you can configure this uh, module federation thing a lot. Uh, for, for example, you can define imports and exports, uh, which should be remotely included. Um, uh, you want to provide to other bundles. 
And if those external exports are not available, there should be a fallback to the own dependency. Um, in an overview, it looks like that. Here we have two bundles, which are used by the browser, and both, both use pattern slip as a dependency, but only one of those is downloaded. Even if you have in the bundles different versions of pattern slip, you can configure which version you need as a minimum requirement, and then um, it's more or less automatically figured out for you. Both bundles have a complete set of all the JavaScript uh, dependencies in it, but the browser only downloads what is actually needed. Um, you can, the configuration is not so hard. It's basically this, you import the meta module federation plugin and configure it like here. I have defined here pattern slip as a dependency, which should be used as a singleton because you just want to have it instantiated once, also jQuery. And you have to slightly adapt your entry point, the JavaScript file which, which is loaded uh, when you open the web page, the one which you include in the script stack. And this looks like that, this index, not JSON, but JS. Um, you actually import another file where all your other dependencies are defined. You only have this single one input in here. And uh, that makes Webpack split out all the code to separate JavaScript files. And um, the single one anti point is then just a few kilobytes big, like 10 or 20 or so. The point, it's not only this input, which is added by Webpack. Webpack adds more code so that it can find all the other modules, which it's uh, actually depending on. It's quite a new approach and um, we have to still experiment with it and, um, and test it more deeply. But the first experiments looked quite promising and yeah, I'm looking forward to this. With that, we can allow add-ons to install JavaScript without recompiling. Thank you, that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Uh, looks interesting, although the scariest two words, well, some of the scariest two words in my book are almost automated, but <laughs> we'll see where this goes. Um, next, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome back a voice that we haven't heard for a while in the Plum community nowadays, also known as Rearer of Llamas. It is, I give you the uncomparable David Glig with Snowfakery. Yeah, and I'll be back in just a minute. I need to uh, restart Zoom to be able to share my screen, unfortunately. Uh, working on that. Coming, coming, coming. Otherwise, just show us llamas. We're happy. And he's back. And he's muted. Hopefully this will work now. <laughs> Yay. All right. Yeah. Good to be back here uh, with the Plone community. It's been a bit of time since I've uh, gotten to see you all. And since it's probably been like a few years since I've run build out. But uh, I wanted to show a different open source tool uh, in Python that a colleague of mine uh, named Paul Prescott created. And it's a tool called Snow Fakery for generating uh, fake data. So if you saw the talks from Philip and Fred earlier today, you learned about collective.export import, which is this nice new tool for uh, dumping data out from one site and importing it into another. Um, Snow Fakery is a little bit different use case. Um, Either uh, you're, you're doing development or testing and you need to get realistic uh, data, but not real production data into 
uh, your system. Uh, or maybe you're doing performance testing and you want to do that same thing, but like at a really big scale, load lots of data. So we had like a bunch of Python scripts that we were using to do this sort of thing and just like looping through a bunch of uh, imperative code. And we realized we'd like to have something declarative. So I'm going to try to do a live demo. Um, we created this thing that, that uses YAML. So I'm sure some people will yell at me about that. But uh, basically, you write this recipe in YAML. And so this is saying we want to create uh, three folders. Each folder has uh, some fields. There's a title, uh, which is going to come from, this is from the Python faker library. So we're going to generate a fake country name. Uh, the ID is going to use this expression here to like normalize that into an ID format. Uh, we're going to set the parent to uh, the root of the clone site. And then each of these folders is going to have some objects, which are friends uh, that get created uh, in conjunction. So we're going to create a page. Uh, well, actually, we're going to create somewhere between one and five pages for each folder. Um, and we'll set the parent appropriately um, to the ID of the folder that was created above. And then we'll generate a fake company name. So I'm just going to run this here on the command line. Um, it supports multiple output formats. So by default, it'll just print the standard out um, this data. You can see we've got three folders and some, some documents for each one. Um, I can also output that to uh, JSON. Uh, this will generate a different set. Um, and if I look at that here, we can see this is in JSON, but it's not the right format for importing the clone. It's got like table instead of type and things like that. So I'm going to use a slightly uh, modified output format here that I did. And now we've got something that looks like what we could import into the REST API. Um, and now I'm going to hop over to Plone. And I just fired up Plone 6 using the Docker image, which is really great. It got it going in a couple minutes. Um, it's got collective export import installed. So I'm going to browse for my file, choose that, and hit import. And then if the demo gods are with me, another second here. There, we've got our folders and uh, some, oh, that's fun. We got Steve McMahon represented here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's no fakery. And then um, see if I can do anything else with my time. Uh, this is my like modified output thing. It's basically just making sure that we have all the fields that are required uh, to do the import. Um, I can, uh, change the locale here to German and because faker supports different locales, uh, we'll get our fake data in German. Uh, let's see, Paraguay, what's it? Yeah, there. So like Jordan is in German now and we've been generating some German company names. Uh, so yeah, that's no fakery. It's uh, open source. Uh, you can use it standalone and then, you know, maybe there's a little bit of work that needs to do to make it easier to use with the clone, but I just set this up this morning. So it worked pretty well. Thank you, David. And might I add, if you just add some restrictions so that the countries are actually tax havens and you generate fake company names. This is a business model for every startup. Um, ju just restrict it to the Virgin Islands and whatever and register all of them. But then again, yeah, I know you're not that kind of person. Um, next up, we have Philip Bauer, who is going to do one small VS code trick. Knowing him, it's not going to be small. It's not going to be one trick, but we'll see. Philip, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's actually a really small trick. I hope you can hear me. I'm unmuted and my video is on, so I think all everything is good. Otherwise, just yell at me. Uh, so during uh, this week's, uh, this year's uh, Master and Clone Training, uh, for the first time, I didn't use two different browsers, uh, two different editors for um, Volto development and Plone development. I used VS Code for both. 
Uh, and that is uh, because of one small thing that I figured out. So this is a project, uh, older project. Um, um, uh, Katrin will know what this is probably if you listen to this. Uh, so um, it was a project from this spring, I think, and I haven't used VS Code at that time. So um, when I have an editor and I want to integrate the whole Python thingies, um, there's it's always pretty daunting uh, to if I try to solve uh, set up the okay Python Python stuff the whole Python stuff so that it actually works fine. So um, this hasn't been included in my new new setup yet because it's not that big. So I open it for the for the basically very first time. It's just the default our default build arts got some code. Oops, I hope I haven't moved anything just because I moved my mouse. So yeah, here's some whatever code. Let's look at some code. There is a module thingy and here are all these imports. And after a while, it realizes that, uh, yeah, everything is curly, underlined curly in a curly way because I already have the, uh, the excellent extension Python extension and PyLance, the uh, language server, which is the default uh, in the current VS Code installed. But it doesn't know where Plone Dexterity content import item come from. So I'd have to search for that. And I use my omelet uh, to do that and stuff or packages, the folder. So that is super annoying because I really want to, I hate these lines. I want to get rid of them. There is one very, very simple fix for that because probably like all of you uh i also have um something in my bin folder because my build out is configured like that and it's called zopi and that's it uh, so i uh, here is your python uh, executable the default is picked for a reason that you can look up a lot of documentation but the easiest way to just solve your problem forever is just to copy the path for Zopi, click here, scroll, enter interpreter path, say enter, and after a second or two or three or four, I hope it has the right one. Maybe I close the file again and open it again. And the screen sharing always takes a toll on the processor. As I said, my new, uh, my new laptop hasn't arrived yet. So yeah. It's not curly anymore, so all the imports are found. I can go go to definition, and there is my simple term. So that's it. No more uh, build out recipes uh, because OP is is actually something that you need probably for every project, and your uh, VS Code is configured to work perfectly with the Python project uh, in Plone because all the packages are in there. So that is a, a really cheap trick, uh, which gets you uh, set up uh, for Python projects in VS Code. So it's actually really small, nothing big. Uh, thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure to have uh, had the last slot of lightning talks. No, you next. don't. I don't have that shit. want to say something. No. Uh, do I have no. a second more? I'll just... Uh, um. Pour 48. Some, some scotch, 48 seconds. I'll use them to pour some scotch and raise a toast to all of you in the lovely Plone community. Thank you uh, for giving me the life that I have. Have a great evening. Bye. And then the last talk, um, the last lightning talk, after which I will have a final very short announcements um but the final talk live from here uh where here is defined as the sorrento uh, plum conference fan zone is by erica andre who will be talking about new docker images Hi. shiny things take it away okay let's go i'm controlling everything now here so i hope it works yeah we love containers Okay. Okay. Philip, you need to stop sharing. You're over sharing anyway.
but okay yay we love containers okay we always loved containers most companies uh, uh, that we've been talking are using containers some way or another of course some of us had a love and hate relationship especially with docker and uh we are getting over it maybe docker will get over it as well but so far so good we have a new generation of blown docker images they are not yet officially support yet we hope to fix that until the end of the this conference to have everything documented we have a blown backend image supporting already five to six and six zero alpha one we have a plum front end image uh using confusingly voto 14 and node 14 also, we have a Plum Zeo image for those of you that still run Zeo because the shiny new thing and we like shiny new things is not so shiny, not so new, but real storage. And we have a Plum AJ Proxy one that already come with uh, uh, some nice things. Thanks to EA for donating that to us. I need to install my own products. How do I do it? You start with the default image, run pip install, add your add-on here, and then use deprecated legacy resolver because even though Maurits is super productive, the guys in uh, maintaining pip did not press the merge button and release. We hope this is fixed soon, or I hope they already did and I'm just saying, uh, saying old news here. But as soon as you do this, you start the new image, your plugin is there. So it support, oh, one important thing. All these images are based on pip. So there's one trick. You need to declare dependencies. So you do a on your config CML, include and in the name of uh, the other package you use in your uh, installation. I was looking at some of the, the most popular uh, add-ons. They already have that. So it's not a big deal. It's just a matter of keep, uh, keep doing that. We support environmental variables. So I want to set up a, 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 like a, a stack with zero. We basically pass the environmental variable zero address and ta-da. I want to support rel storage with Postgres. We are not yet supporting MySQL or Oracle in the main image, but you do hell storage DSN, pass the value and ta-da. We have more examples with Docker Compose available in github.com slash plone slash plone front ends. Read me using Docker Compose. We uh, will keep adding more there. That's interesting because this is the complete setup for you to have plone sex with Voto Shiny working out of the box. And this is brought to you by the lovely installer team. I would like to, to ask for applause for all of them. Jens, Alin, Silvio Tomatis, Steve, because Steve is our uh, BDFL. Okay. It's hard. They gave me a uh, uh, boost during my last talk. So I'm kind of slow now. And I'm part of this team for now. And that was it. Thank you all.